Good afternoon. Uh, we're about to have what should be a really stimulating conversation about food security in the age of uncertainty. Uh, we have three great panelists who are going to uh, guide us through this conversation. And uh, why don't I start with um, Sarah, and we'll talk about the whole picture of uh, food insecurity. Let me ask you first, why don't you give us a state of play? How are things uh, in terms of uh, food security? We hear a lot from politicians and others. Is it lip service, or are we really seeing some uh, work being done there? Well, we've been talking about food security since the 1970s, so <laughs> there's that. But I think in terms of state of play, you know, we're at very sort of truly unprecedented times for our global food systems. There's a few things at play simultaneously. In early 2020, before COVID started, China effectively became a structural importer of grain. China had never been an importer of major grains. Then COVID came in and disrupted our supply chains. We're still reeling from the effects of that and sort of what happened. Then you had a Russia-Ukraine war, which disrupted trade flows and agricultural sort of production. Meanwhile, you also had three years in a row of La Nina, which caused droughts in South America and the United States, both the largest exporters of food products around the world, at a time when we also have a currency crisis brewing in every other part of the world. So when you say, you know, where are we in terms of state of play and sort of from a global food security standpoint, what comes to mind that is even in the US, if you look at the price of a basket of food over the last essentially three years, it's still up 66%. If you look at Sudan, it's up 2,000%. You look at Lebanon, it's up 3,000%. So, you know, we're so far from sort of having fixed the systems and to me, one of the, the sort of bigger worries, worrisome plays we have right now is actually the confluence of the currency crisis, a debt crisis, and a food crisis, and what that actually ends up meaning for political stability around the world. Because many countries have issued an unprecedented amount of foreign currency denominated debt that they have to pay in US dollars, which is the same dollars they have to use to import their food, which has been devalued because of the, so you just have this virtuous cycle. So I think sort of looking out the next 12, 24 months, the biggest issue we have to solve from a food security standpoint is actually the debt question for a lot of countries. And I want to get to, uh, to the debt question in a minute, but I want to go to Etherin and ask you, you've been deeply involved in helping to solve this problem. Um, it's been going on, as Sarah said, for decades now. I mean, what's going on? Why is it taking so long? Yeah, with, when Sarah paints the picture for us of the challenges that the global community is facing from our food system and the, and the debt crisis, let's put that into people, numbers of people. There are 828 million people who are severely food insecure as we're sitting here now. What that means is that without assistance, they will go hungry. We know that there are some places in the world today that there should have been a famine declared because babies are dying in, South, in um, Northeast Africa, in Somalia, for example. Um, but we talk about that 828 million, but there are 2.3 billion people who are also acutely food insecure, which means they don't know where their next meal is going to come from. 2.3 billion people in that category. 150 million children who are chronically malnourished as we speak here today. That means that they're stunted. When you are stunted, the effect on your brain is irreparable. The effect on your height, on your growth, on your physical growth is irreparable. At the same time, half the people on the globe today cannot afford a diverse, nutritious diet. And we know that climate, conflict, and economic instability are the three primary drivers of food insecurity and chronic malnutrition across the globe. And the challenge is that what we're seeing is the paucity of investment that is necessary, not in humanitarian response. Because let me tell you, last year, there were many of us who were raising the roof about the confluence 
of the challenges of economy, food insecurity, and at that time, fuel prices as well, that we were afraid we were entering a perfect storm that would result in massive famines. The world stepped up. WFP has never raised more money. They raised $14 billion last year, fed 150 million people for the first time. So humanitarian, thank you world. We are doing the things that are necessary to ensure that we avoid the crisis. But what we're not doing, we're not investing in the resilience that is necessary, in the adaptation of agriculture that is required to support a sustainable transformation of our food system that will create a food system that supports our environment, human health, and the economic return that is required for all of the actors across the food system, from the farmer to the investor. That's not happening in too many places around the world today. Let, let me ask you, that, I want to come back to you on a couple of points that you made, but first though, uh, let's have um, Ellie pick up on the investment piece, because you talk about the paucity of investment. Ellie, from what you said, you, you are very deeply involved in this space. Do you agree? Do you see the same thing? I see the opposite, and I think the issue we've had is a marketing problem. So I can say I started my private equity firm five years ago um, and actually went straight to the Middle East around this concept of food security. I'm from Alaska. Most people don't know this. Carlisle, my father's firm, was started in Alaska. We import 95% of our food. I'm the granddaughter of a commercial fisherman. Fish touches your plate nine times before it reaches a grocery store. It should be three. So I pioneered this concept that wasn't plant-based, it was a food supply chain global private equity firm. I'm here to tell you, we've just announced, we've raised 640 million over four and a half years. That is the largest growth equity player in the world. But you look at people like I see my friend Peter in the audience, the reason that it's moving ahead is because of these buyout syndicates of people helping reduce the CapEx dollars on infrastructure, people helping reduce the 4X times of energy costs in order to produce food. So when you look at what food supply chain and food security mean, it doesn't mean anymore foreign direct investment. What it means is profitable business models that are your standard private equity firm that have revenue, that more importantly, the top line growth is growing. Why? Well, even as inflation goes through the roof, we are taking dollars away from the healthcare segment. That is very important to point out. You absolutely can have human health, animal health, and environmental health. I'm fresh off of six hours of LPAC meeting from some of the most sophisticated Europe and Middle Eastern investors. And what we see is they're very happy that we have returns, but more importantly, they're very happy we've done this with ESG. One more note on that. I've had the honor of actually sitting on the Alaska Permanent Fund Board. We are the largest sovereign wealth fund in the US, $80 billion. I'm the sole female on it. I spend almost every day monitoring some of this ESG. And what we can tell you in Alaska, and I've, I've been helping our governor and the state build out food security, again, we import 95% of our food, exactly like the many countries in the Middle East. But Climate change has given us an unprecedented um, uh, occurrence to be able to have land that's virgin soil and more importantly have energy, things like a gas line where you have the lowest carbon footprint and you can actually um, produce energy that's carbon friendly, access markets that may have geopolitical instability due to shipping routes opening. You can go to Europe, you're nine hours away. You can go to Asia, you're nine hours away. So we actually look at it as probably a once in a generation lifetime opportunity where food security, just like energy security, has always usually been the dominant market powers. We see that unless you're food secure, you can't just say you're energy secure. So that's why we're very thankful to our Middle Eastern investors who have always believed in this concept and truly been some of the greatest funders in this asset class. You know, Sarah, I want to go to you in a, in a minute, but first I want to go back to Ethereum. No, Ellie says there's a lot of money flo uh, floating into the space. How are you missing it? Here's a reality. She's right but she's also very wrong. And where you're wrong is that there are places where capital doesn't flow, where risk is defined by investors as too high, and the lens that they use, they do not invest. Whether you're talking about some of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that should be receiving more investment, like Ghana and Kenya and even Nigeria, where there are opportunities for investment, but the capital doesn't flow at the pace that it should. 
What we see in, with too many investors is they see the continent as one country. When you talk about Africa, they will say, well, you know, Africa's too risky. I said, you know, there are 54 countries in Africa, and they all have very different risk ratios that require more work that um, I wish you were right. I know here in the United States, let's not go to Africa, let's talk about here in the United States. Let's talk about our urban communities in the United States where we have redlining for investment that entrepreneurs are now receiving bit capital to start business. Nobody starts more businesses in the United States than black women. Those businesses don't scale because of lack of access to capital. So the challenge is that the risk lens that we use has limited the flowing of capital to certain geographies and certain entrepreneurs, particularly in the asset classes of food and, and, and agriculture. Because this has been a challenging asset class because it does not have the pace and level of returns that FinTech and energy and transportation and some of the others do. But it is quite critical. You are absolutely right. We must change the investment paradigm in the food and agriculture space in order to increase the access to that capital, but more importantly, to transform the food system in a manner that will address the challenges of us having the capacity to feed ourselves, because we need to increase agricultural production by some 60% in order to feed the population that is projected for 2050. It's not happening today. We are off track. Well, uh, so, uh, I, I'd I'm love serious. to respond. I mean, <laughs> I always tell people I live in a state where we're three times the size of Texas, but 80% of the population is not on the road system. So it, it, I've had many friends that have built their careers. I know one of Sarah's investors in Africa working on carbon management bills or looking at food systems. And then they come to Alaska and they're like, there's actually more infrastructure in, in, in Africa. But here nor there, what I think is more important, I actually was happy to see three women on this panel because what we know is that consumer expenditures today <laughs> that are driving the food chains are actually coming from women. The, the women are the ones that are still purchasing food in their homes um, for their families. A and also, I love that you just said that food is an asset class. I've spent 13 years in this, and it only took until the institutional capital came on um, that people actually recognize that food is an asset class. And that's part of why I think we all have to work together and bring in the energy capital and the infrastructure capital. It's coming. You know, um, when we started in, in being Alaskan, we always were branded an emerging market as an emerging, man or emerging manager in an emerging marketplace. And those are the titles that I think are starting to go away the more that you can prove to somebody this is fundable. And, and your point about debt, you know, you're watching in, in the debt markets, there's so much now private debt available if you can help de-risk it. And so I always tell people, bring in the syndicates, do what you're really good at, make production one area. You know, one example I would give you is we, we actually are the largest exporter of beef out of Uruguay. And I remember many US investors weren't happy about that when a North American fund manager was so focused on beef in Uruguay. We have four times the amount of production, and also the, we were able to eliminate one part of the supply chain, which turns out during Ukraine became one of the most volatile one, which is fertilizer. And so you're watching new categories of food disrupt this. So you look at things like regenerative agriculture, where it is literally the animals feeding on grass, rotational grazing. It may help with some of the wildfires of climate, and you increase four times the amount of production. So I think it's part of it is a mentality of we have to get out of the fact that you think that you can go to the grocery store and get anything made hyper-local year-round, you still need a global supply chain. There's just a, a true mismatch of where food is produced and where it's needed. Yeah, really. uh, I, want to, uh, I want to get, Sarah, I'll get to you, I promise, in a second. But I also want to tell everyone that we'll take a question, maybe two from the audience, depending on how much time we have. But um, Sarah, I wanted to get to you quickly to talk for a minute because you're between where these two women sit, literally and figuratively, <laughs> in, 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 terms of, uh, in, in terms of what you are, uh, you know, you're seeing the investment or are you not? Uh, what, uh, what we were talking, maybe a marketing issue, how can we uh, try to uh, get more attention to the investment? You know, I think that 
the inherent cost of capital, why I started my business, which is a data business. It's a data business on our food systems and the effects that climate and climate change has on physical assets around the world, from farmland to buildings to power plants. Why did I start it? I started it because I was an oil and gas trader. And while I was an oil and gas trader, I witnessed firsthand how better data and better information reduced the cost of capital that made tons of capital accessible to energy producers. What happened was we went from a world where coal is what we mostly use to generate power in the US to making natural gas more affordable and cheaper than coal because shale gas and shale oil got funded. That got funded because oil producers that, or gas producers that couldn't sell you oil or gas one or two years forward, could sell that to me 20 years forward, use that capital to go drill and sort of discover it. That drove down that cost, then solar came into the picture, but essentially the inherent cost of capital and energy literally went down significantly that funded a ton of innovation. Now, if we look at where we are with global agriculture and global food markets today, first of all, we have tens of thousands of different products, of which you can trade maybe eight liquidly on an exchange. <laughs> most other things are bought day to day, week to week. Even Walmart is buying most of its fresh produce week, week to week. It isn't thinking about what it needs one, two, three, four years in advance. We don't have systems to do that. And so, data becomes the enabler to drive down the cost of capital because the most liquid commodity in the world for agriculture is corn in the United States. If a farmer can go sell that two years forward, it's still a miracle today in America. So in a world where we're selling oil and gas 20 years forward to fund innovation, we're not doing that in our global ag markets. We're not doing that in the US let alone in sub-Saharan Africa. So we need to drive down the inherent cost of capital, which is just mispriced. The minute we do that, it will unlock so much innovation, different types of return profiles, and I think opportunities. But for now, I think capital is completely mispriced in our food systems, and our food systems are in no way receiving the amount of money they need to actually undergo the transformation that is necessary to feed the number of people we're gonna have by 2050 alongside the climate disruptions. Terrific, thanks, Sarah. I wonder if anyone has- Can a, I just uh, add on what Sarah uh, just if, said? If, yeah. if we'll come back to you sure. one quick second, but there's a question here, if we can take that and then we'll come back to the speech. Sure. Please. Uh, there's, there's a microphone coming. So I love that you mentioned the cost of capital and corn as a commodity, and wondering, because there seems to be an inherent disconnect between the idea of scale of a commodity like corn that you would be able to, for example, apply this market value to when we know that the distributive factor of corn, for example, globally, means that you have to have it sitting in silos to protect the price. So how do, what has to be fundamentally re-examined to be able to reconcile that with the regenerative agriculture movement, for example, and feeding the world, saving the climate, mm -hmm. and protecting the asset class? I mean, I, I can tell you, we don't invest in, in food companies that have commodities. We're much more focused on newer proteins or newer innovations, such as using fermentation technology because of the risks of climate change or outdoor agriculture. So we tend to like indoor agriculture or reducing the risk of what needs to go into your food. Let's go to Ithra, because I know you wanted to, we've got like 10, 15 seconds left, but can you... Uh... I, I just want to say, when we talk about commodities, let's distinguish commodities from nutritious food. This is when we start talking about people who are hungry, malnourishment, there is a big difference. Yes, we do grow enough commodities. Yes, we do grow enough calories. We don't grow enough nutritious food. We don't have the appropriate subsidies that support the regenerative production of nutritious food. Right. That's the opportunity that is in front of us if we really want to not only feed the world, but nourish the world. Terrific. Thank, I'm afraid we're out of time, guys. Thank you all so much, and th please join me in thanking the panel. Yeah.